famous for a number of books is published, among which are the three I have here, uh, one on second order logic called Foundations of Foundationalism from 1991, Philosophy, Mathematics, Stat Structure and Ontology, where he presents the uh, his structure and his position, which he will discuss today, and his introduction to the philosophy of mathematics. He's also the author of several uh, Papers in international journals in the philosophy of logic, philosophy of math, and the editor of the Oxford Handbook for the philosophy of logic and philosophy of mathematics. Uh, he comes from the Ohio State University, and uh, I'm happy to uh, give you the word. And the talk of today is <coughs> epistemology of mathematics. What are the questions? We have about uh, until four. And uh, you can decide where to stop uh, the talk. Oh, okay. Let's and stop now. <laughs> and <laughs> you allow for clarification in, yeah. in between, right. in the past. Nothing for it. You said nothing for it. <laughs> right. That's right. Any questions? <laughs> All right. Thank you for the invitation. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I've only been to Italy a few times. First time in Milan in 35 years or so. And the last time I think I was just here to change planes and then the plane didn't, uh, there was a problem with the plane and so we had to come into Milan for a day and that was it. <laughs> and so, you know, delighted to be here and um, you know, I'm looking forward to, to hearing from you. Um, so this sort of takes off from a paper that I published in uh, the Philosophical Quarterly um, about a year ago, maybe a little more. and. Um, that takes off from a criticism that was leveled against me on the epistemological side against uh, my, my, uh, my view in philosophy and mathematics by Fraser McBride. And reacting to that uh, got me to think a little harder, a lot harder about, uh, about epistemology and mathematics. And so that's sort of what this, this talk is about. Um, so according to the, um, the, philo the philosophy of mathematics that's in, in, uh, in question, uh, you can sort of hold up one of those books, that one, right? This one. The one developed in there. <laughs> it's called uh, anti ramp Structuralism, and the idea is that uh, the subject matter of a branch of mathematics is a structure, or a class of structures. Uh, and the structures exist objectively, independently of the community of mathematicians and scientists, their minds, their form, you know, in form of life, and so on. So it's, um, uh, it exists objectively. It's kind of a variant of traditional Platonism, at least on the ontology side. Uh, of course, this is not a talk in ontology and metaphysics, but that's sort of where the view begins. Uh, and then uh, the questions that are raised are, well, if that view is right, then what's the epistemology? So, but the questions aren't really central to the, that particular philosophy. I think they're very general questions that, that, uh, that are being raised here. All right, so, oops, how do I change? There we go, all right. So the title of uh, Fraser McBride's uh, uh, article is um, Can Anti Rem Structuralism Solve the Access Problem? Oh, there's a handout that should be going around or yeah, exists. Or right. Maybe not enough copies. But yeah. The handout and the slides are exactly the same. So uh, it's just, right, okay. All right. So there's a general problem with, uh, with realist views, Platonist views uh, on the metaphysics side, namely, if mathematics is about these abstract things, then how can we know anything about them? How can we have access to, got a question, Margo? Raise your hands. Uh, how can we have, if we, uh, if we can't have access to them because they're abstract, then how can we know anything about them? Uh, 
the, the heart of the matter, I think, concerns the goals, the epistemological goals and burdens of contemporary philosophy and mathematics, and perhaps philosophy of science and other, other disciplines as well. What is the issue that structuralism has to solve, or any realist philosophy has to solve? <coughs> any philosophy that takes the subject matter mathematics to be an objectively existing realm of abstract objects. What's the what's the problem that the epistemological problem there that we have to solve? Um, all right, now the, uh, Fraser um, glosses the problem as one of this, these are his words of explaining how mathematicians can reliably access truths about an extra ex, abstract realm to which they cannot travel and from which they receive no signals. So if the mathematical universe is something that is, as Plato thought, independent of us, then we can't go there. Whatever that means. We can't uh, get any signals back from there, so how can we know anything about it? Right, so that's the, that's the question. Um, so, and here's how he elaborates it a bit. And, and so he's putting a, uh, he's articulating a very well-known, established, uh, and ancient problem right, for <coughs> philosophies of this kind. Whereas on the face of it, the singular terms of mathematical discourse refer to inner and abstract objects. They are not located in space and time. Mathematicians, humans, are essentially inhabitants of a concrete realm of causation and change. So a face value or realist interpretation of mathematics appears to make a mystery of how mathematicians access truths about the mathematical domain. To access, to access them, it appears mathematicians must do the impossible. They must transcend their own concrete natures to pass over to the abstract domain. All right, now, when uh, proposing a philosophy of mathematics, you have to say something about epistemology. Well, I shouldn't say have to, because a lot of people don't. But one should say something about epistemology. Uh, you should indicate how it is that mathematics is known. Uh, and the epistemology should somehow, do, should somehow fit in with the metaphysics and ontology. So it should be made plausible that what it is you're knowing, according to epistemology, are the very things that the metaphysics says that the subject matter is about. Now, I acknowledge that in the book. That book, right? So I've got a little visual effect here. Right? I acknowledge that. Uh, writing that the human mathematician is, is a thoroughly natural being situated in the physical universe. And so any faculty that the knower has and can invoke in pursuit of knowledge must involve only natural processes amenable to ordinary scientific scrutiny. Right? And there's some quotes from me that, um, well, from my book, right? Uh, uh, that um, are, in effect, pointing out uh, essentially the same issue, the same problem. We can't, um, uh, let's just look at the second one. So the realist though, some account of how a physical being located in a physical universe can come to know about abstracts like mathematical objects. The burden is on the realist to show how realism and ontology is compatible with naturalized epistemology, with epistemology as understood as an ordinary scientific in endeavor. So what would be out would be Plato's own epistemology, right? Well, again, I'm not an expert in Plato, but as it's usually as I learned it, right? Um, Plato assumed that, that human beings have some sort of mental grasp of the abstract realm, right? Uh, that would not be subject to ordinary scientific scrutiny. There isn't any little test you can give and run laboratory experiments. So that would be the sort of thing that would be not available to a to someone who trying to do naturalized epistemology. Uh, okay. Now, um, all right. so skipping a little bit. So there are two interrelated groups of issues that need to be settled before the problem can be fully articulated and proposed solutions adjudicated, before you can figure out what's going on. So there's two questions that, you know, uh, or two groups of questions that are closely interrelated that I want to separate for now. One of them cern concerns the resources that can be used in giving the epistemology. All right, so that's the, um, naturalized epistemology side. What can we assume, what can we attribute to the human knowers when we're trying to say how it is that they know what they know? And the other concern is what the burden is. What must the realist establish and on what standards? Now, uh, on the first issue, um, the one about resources, I'd like to try to, um, to use a metaphor to steer a course between two extreme positions. So there's two extreme positions and I want to reject both of them and find something in, in the middle. So one of them is a sort of reductive epistemology. And that's the one that, that is what I would think is virtually impossible. So from this perspective, when giving an account of mathematical knowledge, 
you can't presuppose any mathematics. That is, when accounting for knowledge on this, this picture, you can't assume any mathematics because we're trying to show how it is we know it. It's kind of like the, you know, a traditional foundationalist enterprise. Uh, or at least you can't presuppose that any mathematics is known. Uh, you have to describe the knower and the processes used to obtain knowledge, mathematical knowledge, in non-mathematical terms. That's the reductive part. And then show that these knowers do indeed end up with mathematical knowledge. Right. So that would be a pretty hard task, I would think. Uh, so on this view, the uh, philosophers show how such processes result in knowledge of a realm of abstract objects, such as numbers, points, and sets. Now, um, as, as McBride notes in the second to last paragraph of his article, I, don't, I reject this extreme orientation to epistemology. I'm not trying to show um, um, how somebody knows mathematics without assuming that any mathematics is true or even that any mathematics is known. I said that we can't ground mathematics in any domain or theory that is more secure than mathematics itself. All attempts to do so have failed. Right? So the reductive epistemology is, um, I don't regard that as my problem, and I don't regard this as even possible. All right. The other extreme, right, so that's the one extreme, the kind of reductive epistemology, where you have to try to show that somebody knows mathematics without assuming anything. The other one is um, the other extreme, that there's really no, no, no burden at all. Right. So the other extreme view concludes from the broadly uh, naturalistic orientation that there's no access problem at all. At the end of that paragraph, the second to last paragraph in the article, uh, he mentions this position as well, perhaps on my behalf. All right, so um, here's uh, Fraser, here's, here's McBride. Keep calling him Fraser, that's his first name. We're good friends, so. Uh, if, despite the nasty things we say about each other in, in, in print, right, uh, in articles. So if foundationalism is dead, uh, that's a sort of reductive idea that you can somehow ground mathematics in something absolutely certain without presupposing mathematics. Then it may appear the access problem cannot but dwindle away. For the demand which Shapiro himself issues to the mathematical epistemologist to provide an account of how a physical being located in a physical universe can come to know about abstracts may appear to be nothing but a demand whose strictures can't be met, namely that of providing a source of extra mathematical certainty to underpin mathematical practice. So we have to show that from our better philosophical point of view, mathematics really is certain and really is getting it, mathematicians really are getting it right. Um, so the second extreme, which I'm going to avoid as well, so we already had the one extreme, the reductive one, the, other, the second extreme says there's no problem to be solved, okay? Uh, that philosophers, naturalistically minded philosophers, need only maintain commitment to the epistemic standards that mathematicians themselves have adopted. So the only job for the epistemologist on this, on this uh, extreme view, extreme picture, uh, is uh, well, it's not so extreme. I mean, a lot of people that people have it who don't look so extreme. But the only uh, job on this view for the epistemologist is to describe what mathematicians do, maybe in conjunction with the sociologist and the psychologist. It's just a matter of mathematical psychology. Right? There's all this uh, going on here, sociology. Right. All right. So the upshot of uh, this sort of view is a kind of what's called quietism. There's really nothing to be done, or nothing that needs to be done. The philosopher takes it that we obviously do have mathematical knowledge and leaves it at that. And there's nothing else to be done except to note what the standards are, right, internally. All right. Um, all right, so as I said, I want to try to steer a course between those, right? What, what I take the job in epistemology to be is not that and not that. All right. All right. Um, all right, so that's what it isn't. All right, so according to uh, my, the book, my book, Mathematics is about a realm of anti-rem structures, right, which I mentioned at the beginning. So if I'm right, any, and I am, uh, anybody, who has, has their, anybody who has arithmetical knowledge has knowledge about that structure, right? So if, if arithmetic is a structure, that, uh, sorry, if the natural numbers are a structure, arithmetic is about it, then anybody who has arithmetic knowledge has knowledge about that structure. Um, on our, extrep on our second extreme view, there's no access issue to worry about, but the view is not very illuminating either. Right? It doesn't really say anything, it just says, mathematicians know what they're doing, and leaves it at that. Uh, we just rely on, all right, so what would be missing from the second view, the, the, the well, the non-view, of just saying there's no problem, uh, is an explanation of how the 
proposed epistemology links up with the proposed ontology. So how do the techniques adopted by mathematicians and others lead to knowledge about places in anti-REM structures? Right? That's what I take the burden to be, to show how it is that when mathematicians do what they do, they end up with knowledge of what I'm saying mathematics is all about, namely structures. Uh, so what is the middle ground? Uh, in the book, I didn't say much. Um, but I did say something about philosophy and ma mathematics generally. I guess we don't need to go with this. Um, all right, let's move on. All right, so now, in my epistemology chapter, uh, in chapter four in the uh, structuralism book, I tried to describe some techniques and procedures that mathematicians invoke or can invoke that result in beliefs about structures. And I propose that in favorable cases, at least some of these techniques result in knowledge. So what I take the goal, the, the goal of the epistemology to be is to show how it's plausible that both ordinary people and mathematicians end up with knowledge about anti-REM structures. Um, he takes issue with these, the, McBride takes issue with my claims and arguing that the access problem is as bad as it ever was, that I haven't really made any progress on. All right, so this takes us to our other batch of, remember I said there's two batches of questions. The first one concerns what can we presuppose when we're giving our epistemology. The second one concerns what the standards are, right? What is it that um, I, have to, that I have to show and, and on what grounds? So what, what does it take to show or make it plausible that a given account of mathematics, of mathematical knowledge is correct? Now, do I have to prove or the philosopher have to prove from self-evident uh, premises using self-evident rules of inference that the epistemology is correct, right? You have to somehow derive it in a kind of uh, Cartesian sense from obvious uh, or self-evident beginnings. That, uh, or does the uh, philosopher have to prove that uh, mathematicians and ordinary folk have, the, have mathematical knowledge doing this proving from non-mathematical premises? And if not, then what are the standards, right? What is the game? that we're trying to play and win here. Right. Uh, now, now, mathematics itself may or may not be a foundationalist activity. Right? I mean, that's a, a big issue, right, as to what the, what the nature of mathematics itself is, whether it's kind of a, a Phrygian or a Cartesian type of foundationalism or moralistic or what. Right? Uh, but philosophy, it, it, surely philosophy isn't, right? Rationalism notwithstanding. <coughs> Uh, I, the goal of, I take philosophy to be a holistic enterprise. The goal of my book was not to provide a deductive argument from a commonly accepted premises to the conclusion that, that anti-REM structures exist and that the, uh, we have access to them, whatever access means. We know things about them. I would not know how to even begin doing that, uh, nor would I hold an opponent to a similar standard. Uh, it's a little quote there where I say that. All right, so uh, to elaborate the, um, well, let's go over the quote. So in this book, so here's me quoting me. Uh, or me quoting the bride quoting. No, it's me quoting me, all right. So in this book, uh, that book, uh, I present an account of the existence of structures. This is a paper that you, uh, you published. So you are quoting you, quoting you, you quoting you, quoting you. Yeah, quoting me, quoting me. Exactly. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, yeah, quoting me, quoting me, yeah, okay. Right. All right, so in this book, uh, I present a, an account, or a previous time slice of me, presented an account of the existence of structures according to which an ability to coherently discuss a structure is evidence that the structure exists. All right, that's part of the epistemology. Right. The, the account is perspicuous and accounts for much of the data. Scare quotes. Mathematical practice and common intuitions about mathematical and argued ordinary objects. The argument for realism is an inference to the best explanation. So I take it to be kind of a holistic enterprise where you tell a story, the story has a, and a, and a metaphysics and it has an epistemology and the thing is decided by how well it accounts for uh, the practice itself that it's meant to explain. All right, so to elaborate this a bit, uh, what I do in the article and what I'll do talk about today a bit is to go over one of his criticisms, one of, one of Fraser's criticisms of the epistemological strategies in the book, reacting to the criticism in light of the issues that we're talking about today. So that's the uh, agenda for the rest of the talk, or at least for a chunk of the, for the rest of the talk. Uh, so the first and most basic, all right, so the claim is that the first and most basic level of mathematical knowledge is what I call pattern recognition. Now this doesn't go very far into mathematics, but it's enough to get the issues on the table, and um, 
So it's enough to get uh, the present, what we want to talk about today, the epistemological matters in focus, even though it's very weak as far as how much mathematics you can get out of this. So the idea is you observe one or more systems of objects arranged in various ways, and you abstract a pattern or structure from the systems. So in the book, I talked about baseball defenses, but Marco gave me all kinds of trouble for that, because he doesn't know what baseball is. Um, so I have to, but again, I'm not going over the book here. We're sort of looking back and looking at, at the strategy. You look at a bunch of uh, systems of concrete objects that have a certain pattern, and you abstract the pattern from those. Now, um, on my proposed rational reconstruction of mathematical knowledge, this is the first encounter with freestanding anti-rem structures. Right. Now, at, but this is the bit I was the the caveat I put at the beginning. At the very best, pattern recognition. <laughs> accounts for knowledge of small finite structures. I mean, maybe it doesn't account for that either, but it doesn't account for more than that. Everyone agrees to, right? Or, well, not everyone. I'm agreeing, or I'm conceding <coughs> that. Um, small finite structures at best, such as the cardinal force structure or the ordinal force structure, those are, those are which are like simple graphs. Nevertheless, since structures are apprehended, <coughs> so are themselves abstract, the access issues can be raised now, right? So the traditional issues can be raised even about these very simple things. How do we know about them, given that they're abstract? And I claim, well, we know about them for pattern recognition, and that's really where the issue begins. Right. So how does a concrete being obtain knowledge of even small abstract structures? Okay. Now, uh, actually, uh, Fraser doesn't challenge that aspect of my story. Go ahead, so maybe we can begin with those. He concedes it for the sake of argument. For, for present purposes, he says, I'll grant that we have a capacity for abstracting simple linguistic numerical patterns from the systems that exhibit them. All right, so that's me quoting me quoting the bride. Right. In, in the concluding section, he agrees that even if universals are abstract, at least some universals gain a toehold in the concrete realm, that's the typo there, through their instances. So at least some universals, even though they're abstract, we can know about them because we can know about their instances. And he concedes that. All right, so um, now we have to look at the next level of the epistemology, which is one he doesn't concede. All right, so the next level in my rational reconstruction invo invokes or postulates a faculty of what I call projection. So our subject mentally arranges the first few cardinal structures, the two structure, the, so a two structure is just the structure of two objects, simple one, right, no relations. The four structure is the structure of four objects. So the subject, the knower, uh, starts looking at a bunch of those and um, realizes that the structures themselves form a pattern. Each, for each one, there's a bigger one. Right. Right. Um, each pattern seems to be extendable to a larger one. The subject then projects this pattern of patterns far beyond those she's encountered by a simple pattern recognition. Right. So what we can get from this is the um, knowledge of large finite structures, which you wouldn't get from pattern recognition. So the structure, the cardinal 9422 structure, that's the structure of any system of objects that has nine, uh, of 9,422 9, objects. We don't really know that by pattern recognition. It isn't like somebody says, oh, what's that? And then you'll arrange that many objects and say that many. Right? You know, we know about three and four that way, but not, right, so how do we know about that, that big one? Right? So even though it's still, it's finite, it's just larger than you can get by pattern recognition. And essentially, not knowledge of the natural natural structure itself, right, would be the next step after that. Right. Now, he <coughs> Fraser agrees that something like the process that, I'm, that I described in the book is operative in the way that simple mathematics is generated. So he concedes that people do think this way. Right. Uh, but what he grants is that what he wants to argue is that they're not really justified in thinking that way. Right. So, and again, justified by what standards? Right. That's but why I'm raising this. So here's uh, McBride again. I shall grant that we do project from the structure of the systems of objects with which we are acquainted. We're acquainted. So he, he grants that we do do this, and thereby do come to grasp structures of exam, instantiating systems of which we cannot literally serve it. So we can, in effect, grasp structures that we can't, whose instances we can't serve it, you know, because they're too big. For who could deny that manipulation of an experiment with systems of objects uh, exhibiting small finite cardinal patterns performs a significant role in our appreciation of structures that cannot be surveyed? So this is in fact what we do. Right? But he argues that 
this concession that we actually do this doesn't solve the problem. Right? <coughs> now, immediately my reaction here is, or when I first read this is, well, what are we saying the problem is? Right? If this doesn't solve it, what's the question that, or so, yeah, what is the question that we're supposed to be answering? All right, so here's, here's Fraser again. Uh, to solve the access problem, it's not enough just to undertake the descriptive project of detailing our habits of belief formation, right? So he's saying it's not enough to do that. It's not enough to say how it is we come to believe what we believe. We have to show how we come to know what we believe. It is also necessary to undertake the distinctively normative project of coming to an understanding of our justification for holding the mathematical beliefs that we do and the justification which in favorable cases distinguishes mathematical knowledge from mere true belief. Right? So why does this result in knowledge? Right? He, say, he, dis he admits that this is the, the, the process we use to form our beliefs, but why are those beliefs justified? All right, so going on with the quote. Because it concerns the warrant that accrues to our mathematical beliefs, what makes it rational for a subject to frame and maintain beliefs about mathematical objects, this question evident, evidently cannot be answered by purely descriptive means. Showing how somebody comes to have the belief they have is not the same thing as showing that it's justified. And of course, that's an important distinction right, in ordinary epistemology. Showing how somebody comes to believe what they believe, you know, so you know, to take a rather different case, if, you know, somebody is a terrible racist, you want to say, well, how did they come to be that way? Well, you talk about their childhood and what their parents told them and you know the number of times they got hit in the head and some experiences they had. Right. All right. So now we've explained how why they have the belief they have, you know, that uh, people of a certain race are inferior. But of course that doesn't justify the belief, right? So he's certainly Fraser's certainly right that, that describing the process of belief is not the same thing as justifying. Sorry, uh, yeah. Stuart, but yeah. uh, uh, this uh, Fraser formulation is very obscure to me. So in order to better understand the point you can also for that. Okay. What, the, what the he is saying that belief formation is not uh, uh, enough, and that you also need uh, a justification, you need a, a decisive of justification, or, or, he, he, or he's saying that belief formation is not enough, and you need also truth. Uh, no, truth would not be because he says in the end we want to distinguish knowledge from true belief. Yeah. Right. So no. So getting the fact that it's true, that's not the issue. No, we don't. the problem is justification. Yeah, how do we know that that are that? So we he he's conceding that I that I've given a reasonable account as to how the beliefs are formed in in large structures, large finite structures, and e even small infinite ones. But why is that belief justified? Yeah. So that's that first question. you that you that you that's the one he's concerned with. So that belief formation is not a justification for him. We have to no, couple I'm, the belief formation with a justification. Yeah, that's right. And as I, that's why I'm with the example I gave about somebody who has you know, racist beliefs or, or religious, whatever it is, right? Anyone who has false beliefs, you can usually explain how it is they got the belief. Yeah. Right? But that's not the same as okay. justifying. Right? Okay, I did that one. Belief formation is not justification. Yeah, okay. right. At least, that's, at least that's what I take him to be. Right? He's not here to defend himself. But that's what I take, the, the, what I take him to be claiming here. And of course, he's right. There's a difference. Right. All right. So, so let's continue. I think it'll make it. Uh, you know, I think the, the next bit of the quote will, will help as well with with uh, Marco's um, distinction, because it concerns the warrant that accrues to our mathematical beliefs. Right. Not their truth, but the warrant. Right. Why we why we think that they're correct, or why not why we think they're correct, but why are they correct? Right. Um, what makes it rational for a subject to frame and maintain beliefs about mathematical objects? This question evidently cannot be answered by purely descriptive means. So describing how the belief comes about doesn't answer whether it's warranted. Okay. For given the access problem, this leaves it mysterious how we could ever become possessed of such faculty. Unfortunately, Shapiro's stratified epistemology cannot answer the question about warrant because it's lacking in one or the other of these ways. Either it descends into the purely descriptive, that is just describing how we got the beliefs, or it fails to illuminate what it sets out to explain. That is why the beliefs are warranted. Now, um, in the book, actually, I noted a similar issue, uh, and I sounded a kind of holistic Quinean theme in response to it. Right? Um, yeah, so here's me quoting me, quoting me. 
Uh, so anti-realists might concede. So this is this is somebody who think uh, so anti is just somebody who's rejecting the view that there are such things as uh, as abstract objects. Might concede that pattern recognition and other psycholinguistic mechanisms, the other things I talked about in the book, lead to belief in uh, structures, anti rem structures. So they might concede that <coughs> the techniques I'm giving lead to belief in these things, in structures, uh, but anti realists will maintain that these mechanisms do not yield knowledge unless the structures exist. All right, so I was dealing with a different question than the one, or I was dealing with Marco's second question. Uh, in, in, in this paragraph in the book, but, it, but again, the, the response is the same in both cases. Right. All right, so the anti-realists will say, look, this belief doesn't count as knowledge unless it's true. Right. So Fraser's not quite doing that, so this isn't quite the same thing, right, uh, as I see now, thanks to Marco's question, but the response is going to be the same. Uh, can we establish this last ontological claim? Can this be done without begging the question? All right. Uh, I, I, the same thing you could ask about the question of warrant. So in this book, uh, I present an account of the existence of structures according to which an ability to coherently discuss a structure is evidence that the structure exists. Now, of course, I didn't say it's a proof, but it's evidence. Uh, this account is perspicuous and accounts for much of the data. It's the same thing I said earlier. Mathematical practice and common intuitions about mathematical and ordinary objects. The argument for realism including the epistemological side of it, I would add now, uh, is, an art, is, an, is, an, is an inference to the best explanation. Here's the story. It explains what's going on. The nature of structures guarantees that certain experiences count as evidence for their existence. So that deals with the question of warrant. It counts as evidence for their existence. All right, so um, my differences with Fraser come down to a disagreement over what the game, what the rules of the game are, right? When we're doing epistemology, what, what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, and this, the, which is the second of the methodological issues that I raised earlier. Right? What is it that needs to be explained and what counts as a successful explanation, right? So if what it needs to be explained is belief, Fraser says that's easy, but that's not what we're interested in. What needs to be explained is truth, all right, that's the question. All right, what needs to be explained is how we know. Right. Now, I'm, con I'm content to have my account as a whole judged alongside other philosophies of mathematics on the overall score of what does best for accounting for mathematics, its role in our intellectual and personal lives, and using whatever resources are available for evaluating this. So I take it to be a holistic enterprise, an inference to the best explanation. All right, so let's look at the, how am I doing that? Okay, so, so I should stop it uh, like, 315. Yeah, it's okay. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I kind of noted that as I was, uh, when I was sort of preparing this, they said that I prepared way too much, right, as I almost always do. So I was trying to think of where to stop. So rather than use up whatever valuable time I have, I'm here chatting about what it is I'm going to, right, right. So let's look at the more specific charge that he brings against my account of projection, right. So let's take a look at his specific, the, the, the uh, his, as he elaborates the Complaint. Right. So begin with a subject who I call S, who apprehends by pattern recognition the first four finite cardinal structures. And again, remember, he's conceding that, that, that this part is going okay. He's actually apprehending these abstract structures. The one pattern, the two pattern, the three pattern, and the four pattern. Again, so the three pattern is just the, it's the simple pattern because there's no relations. It's the pattern that any three objects uh, exemplifies. Right. All right, so now the subject begins to notice that these patterns themselves exhibit a pattern. Right? We, can, we can order them. Right. Um, let's see, so onward. Right. Now, uh, he correctly notes, Fraser correctly notes, that the learning process that I'm describing here involves the following, what he calls critical translation. Right? So me quoting, me quoting, and pride. Right. So to begin with, the mathematical novice S is disposed to appreciate of each sequence of cardinality structures delivered by abstraction that it may be extended by the addition of a next longest pattern. Right. So each of the first three, well, the fourth one hasn't been extended yet. So each of the first three that the subject uh, looks at, they realize she realizes that each of those can be extended to a bigger one. Right. Uh, but, but so far, S has no inkling of the general fact that the finite cardinal structures collectively exhibit the pattern of an omega sequence, that they go on forever, you know, that they exemplify the natural numbers. 
So far, S has only a habit of forming singular beliefs about particular structures. So, so far he says, yes, that one, that one, and that one. Individual beliefs, right? Uh, of course, S later comes to formulate a fairly general belief and comes to know in a way yet to be explained that every cardinality structure has a unique next longest extension. So again, I don't know how the, it plays out in, in Italian, but there, it's the distinction between each and every. Right? So the subject uh, grasps each one individually and sees that it, that, <laughs> it, um, that, it had, that that one has an extension. And then he comes to believe that, or she comes to believe that they all do. Right? Okay. Um, once this general knowledge has been secured, uh, S can rest assured that the finite cardinality structures form an omega sequence, and therefore they have now they have a grasp of the natural number structure. Right? So this is the first encounter with infinity in the you know in the reconstruction the epistemology I'm giving with an infinite structure. Right? But without this knowledge, without the knowledge that every structure can be extended, um, S can have no assurance that the pattern of cardinality patterns extends not only just beyond but also far beyond the cardinality structures of which S has encountered instances. That it isn't, we just see, okay, I can see how the next few, but we're saying, no, they're always, no matter how far we go into the future, there'll always be a next one. So then he challenges me to show how the mathematical novice may legitimately pass from, uh, all right, so, he, so he's sort of pinpointing the, the, the crucial inference he wants to challenge. Particular knowledge that a given structure has a successor distinct from it, right, one, the first one, the second one, the third one, to general knowledge that all structures, given or otherwise, have their own distinct successors. Right? So, the, so how do I go from the first three to all of them? Well, so onward. Of course, two, oh, you've got the, some of you have the handout in front of me. So two doesn't follow from one logically. Duh, I mean, I know that, right? Right, right. It's an expression I've learned from my kids. Right. Uh, so two doesn't follow from one logically, right? I know that, but thanks for reminding me, Fraser. Right. Um, and I never claim that it does. Right. Uh, so according to McBride, if the subject is going to get, get from one to two, she needs other premises. Right. And I, here's, I think, where the methodological issues really come to the fore, because he's assuming that the argument is going to be deductive, that somehow the, the subject has to know, right, or be able to prove that every structure has a, every finite structure has, has an extension. Right. So what is required to affect a derivational transition? So he's even talking in, in sort of deductive terms. Uh, between these epistemic states, different epistemic states, from one to two, right? One individual ones to the general one. Right, each to every. Uh, is knowledge of the principles which are employed by mathematicians to infer the general view, view from the particular? Perhaps the axioms of piano arithmetic or Melo Frankel or some other mathematical theory. All right, so of course that would work if we could bring arithmetic in. But you surely can't do that, right? Assume that the subject knows arithmetic because that's what we're trying to explain, right? How the subject knows arithmetic. Uh, so that's going to be his point. So in the absence of any grasp of these principles, there can be no assurance that the features displayed by a given finite structure are representative of the features characteristic of the infinite structure of which this is an initial fragment. Right. All right. But however in detail this transition is affected, right, how they go from one to two, two cannot be got out of one without an appeal being made to truths which are of no less general character than two. Right. Right. So you're not going to get two from one unless there's something quite general that you're invoking here, right? But of course, that's the nature of deduction anyway. I mean, that's just how deduction works. You don't get out any more than you put in, right? That's the point of deduction, right? Is you don't, you know, you, you, can't, de you can't deduce more than you, your premise, you know. I mean, sometimes we're surprised when we derive conclusions, but in some sense, right, and they follow. Right? And what it means by it follows is that they're already there, right? Right. Um, right, for any body of truths fit for the purpose of navigating the novice from one to two, if it's going to be a deductive way, right, uh, must already in, must embody, already embody the equivalent of an axiom of infinity. And of course, if it's deductive, yes. I mean, two is an axiom of infinity, and one isn't, right? That's why it doesn't follow. Right. Uh, it follows that these truths cannot be extracted any more than two from the finite raw materials that mathematical novices have at their disposal. Right. 
And again, if it's a deductive enterprise, of course he's right, but then maybe it's not a deductive enterprise. So the op op one key item here is the word derivational in the opening sentence. Is that supposed to indicate a deduction? And I suppose it is. Or I mean, I'm assuming it is, right? Now, he concedes for uh, the sake of argument that most people, or at least some people, do in fact move from one to two. So he's conceding that most people and most mathematicians, as they get their normal training, <coughs> make a move something like from one to two, right? From the, the finite number of instances to the general. But, quote, this still does not explain why it is rational to formulate and maintain the general mathematical principles on which the subject subsequently relies. Yes, again, so it's back to the, yeah, we can describe the belief process, but is it justified? So surely this is what people do, right? Somehow we ended up believing, you know, in, in infinity, those of us who do, right, mathematicians and so on. Uh, and we got to that belief somehow, right? We didn't derive it from the individual instances, right? And anything that we did derive it from, if we derived it, is going to be just as hard to explain. Right. So he can see, he concludes this part of the critique with the union observation. That, uh, and so it's kind of nice, you know, you know, Hume is one of my heroes in philosophy in generally, not philosophy mathematics, but philosophy generally. And, you know, so whenever anyone quotes Hume, I said, start usually cheering. Yeah, 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 right. Um, <laughs> And you know there are problems here, right? And just like Hume says, there's problems of justifying induction. Yeah, there are, right? All right. So novices are inevitably beset by this is phrase, me, me quoting me quoting Fraser. Uh, novices are inevitably beset by poverty of stimulus, which prevents them from ever extracting or extrapolating the infinite from what is given in experience. Right. This. All right. So in effect, we don't really get enough. Uh, stimulus, right, enough data input to get the infinite out, right? Our data, the inputs, what we actually get with our eyes and ears are finite, Plato's point two, right? We're not going to get the infinite out of that, right? Uh, this suggests the Kantian thought that the principles which enable us to project from the finite to the infinite are already innate within us, right? It's just the way we do, it's just what we do, right? It's just innate somehow that we do this, right? But even if it's granted that some more mathematical beliefs are innate, this does nothing what, whatever, this does nothing to account for whatever warrant accrues to those beliefs. Right? So invoking the Kantian idea, well look, this is just what we, we're sort of hardwired, well Kant wouldn't put it this way, but we're sort of uh, built so that we'll, we'll make the, the transition from the finite to the infinite, that doesn't justify it. Right? Uh, we can, or how are we going to have confidence that they're true? And it's sort of to give me a point, right? Hume says, yeah, of course, I know that we're going to, how do we know that the future is going to resemble the past? Well, it always has. Well, that explains maybe why, why and we have a habit of believing that it does. You know, again, you know, if you, you know, know the Humean line, right? But that doesn't justify it, right? So he's raising a similar point here. Right? All right, so if I have the same problem that, that Hume has, you know, um, you know, no one solved that one, so. Right? Yeah. Can you say something, Marco? No, not the truth of the appeal. Is what? Truth. Is truth. There. Oh, well, There's how do we know? the justification, not the truth. Yeah, so how do we know? In fact, yeah, so truth isn't really far from the picture, but it could be, it could even be true, right? But, right, that's why these are separate questions. Yeah, of course, the, if, the, if, the, if the conclusion is not true, right, which is what the anti is going to claim, then of course you don't know it. But even if it is true, we still wonder how it is we know it. Um, all right, so he's correct, as I said earlier that there is an important difference between noting the source of a given faculty or belief, whether it's innate or learned, say, uh, and justifying the reliability of the faculty or the truth of the belief. Okay. Really, both are on um, the table. Right. Both of the uh, two questions that Marco raised are, are, are relevant here. The truth of the belief, and even if we concede that it's true, the reliability of the judgment, right, of the faculty that produced the judgment. Uh, if a faculty of belief is innate, we'd like some explanation for that, but the explanation in question need not sanction, sanction the, the belief itself, Might, the truth of it, or the correctness of it. Right, okay. Um, maybe you can't get through most of this. So what McBride calls two, what is he called? Oh, general knowledge of all, you know, that is the universally quantified thing, general knowledge of all. Now, now where was I before? Uh,
Come back. 24, maybe? Oh, let's get that. Well, how did I get this far? Oh, I'm using the wrong, all right, I'm using the wrong key. <laughs> <laughs> it's the order of the atomic iron sequences. That's right, yeah, so, but yeah, that's right. So with the, one, of the, one of these things is going to make a What is the protection and the protection? Yeah, that's something like that. One of them, those, those I can handle, but there's four of them here. And the other one, I don't know what the other one's doing. The other two are doing. All right, all right, so, uh, so what it calls two, oh, they, all right, is a direct analog of the successor principle in arithmetic, right? That is, that just really is the successor principle as to how that would play out in the, in the epistemology, right? That every finite pattern has an extension. Uh, and that's a consequence of the Dedekind piano axioms that the successor is a one-one function that doesn't have zero in its range. Now, I never claim that the transition to two is a matter of deduction from premises about pattern recognition. Uh, I mean, I'm not that dumb. Uh, nor did I claim that two is apodictic or even knowable a priori. Right? But didn't even claim that, right? So I'm, I'm pretty much non-traditional in the epistemology, or at least it's consistent with being very non-traditional. Not even claim that we know it a priori. Uh, and certainly not on the basis of the paltry results of pattern recognition. All right, but then uh, that's all more on the defensive side. Now I might ask myself, well, what do I claim? Right? So what am I claiming on behalf of, um, uh, of uh, the move from one to two? Right? What does justify it? Because I've already conceded that explaining the belief doesn't, doesn't justify it. All right, so, all right, so from, I mean, I was sort of suggesting I've got kind of a holistic epistemology here where uh, it's not foundationalist where, where it's sort of the whole system of beliefs that's going to be judged together. Um, but from that perspective, as from any other, there's a difference between a premise, a tentative postulate, a working hypothesis, an established belief, and a known proposition. These are all different things, even from my perspective. Right? Uh, for the holist, however, the borders between these notions are fuzzy. They're not sharp borders. Uh, and the items in question are in flux. A proposition can start life as a working hypothesis, or even just as a guess, uh, and it can later become an established belief or a known fact if it proves fruitful, serving an, an essential role in a successful system. Right? So what can start life as a guess or even a working hypothesis, once it's sort of built into the system and, and it looks like it, we're actually starting to explain things with it, uh, then it can, can make the transition to a <coughs> something warranted, and then eventually even known. Um, so in the rational reconstruction of the epistemology of anti structuralism, I'd say something similar about two. Now, I'm not going to remind myself what two is here, because then I'll get lost again. The general, you know, every, because I also, because I remember it, that every pattern has a, uh, has a bigger one. Every finite pattern has a bigger one. All right. So after the uh, noticing that the small finite cardinal structures apprehended by pattern recognition have successors, uh, our subject formulates two as a guess or hypothesis. Later, when arithmetic is up and running and proves to be successful for various purposes, she, she sees, as sees, the subject sees that two has taken on a more central role and may even be dubbed an axiom. Because now it looks like this thing is really paying, it's, it's really paying for itself. It's uh, playing an important role in the theory, and the theory is doing a lot of work for us in explaining what's going on in the world. So it may prove construct, uh, instructive here, I think we can do this, um, to briefly uh, recount the perspective of Zermelo proposed and is established in a celebrated or proof of the well-ordering theorem. Even if this methodology is not compatible with this foundationalist rhetoric. So Zermelo, when you actually read it, this is the founder of set theory, when you actually read his, his rhetoric, it actually sounds uh, traditional foundationalist. You know, vaccines being self-evident and so on, right? But the methodology actually uses is more holistic. And so let's take a look at the, um, at what he actually says in this, in the, in the 1908 art, in the 1908 art, in the 1908 article. So early in the article, he says that the axiom of choice is self-evident. And that's really what this concerns is the axiom of choice in set theory. When it was proposed in 1904, everyone reacted to it. He says, oh, this is, you know, a lot of people who didn't like the, the, the theorem that he proved with it, the well-ordering theorem, said, no, the, there's the problem here, the axiom of choice, it's false. Right. Now, he claimed that it, uh, the axiom of choice is self-evident. That was his phrase. Well, whatever the German for self-evident is. Um, it's not at all clear that what he meant by that. But in light of the criticism that the axiom had endured, uh, for most of the math leading mathematicians of the day, he surely didn't mean that it was obvious. Right. 
I mean, that kind of would be a dumb way to argue, and kind of a stubborn way to argue, right? So I put up this proposition, right? And I say, look, here's an axiom. And, uh, and then a bunch of really smart people who I respect, the leading mathematicians say, no, no, I don't think that's true. How do you justify that, right? And then I was saying, oh, oh, it's self-evident. <coughs> right. Now, if self-evident means obvious, I'm just claiming that all these really smart people didn't see what was obvious, right? You know, in effect, that's just sort of refusing to explain, you know, to justify it. Right. All right. Um, so I don't think that Zermelo meant, uh, maybe he did, maybe he just wanted to be, you know, nasty towards, you know, I mean, these are really smart people, the people who universally recognize to be smart, Bear, Burrell, LeBay, right? The heroes of you know the mathematics at that day. All right. Now, in the, defending the axiomatization in the 1908 paper, Zermelo repeats an earlier assertion that he cannot prove the axiom <coughs> choice, and therefore he cannot be, compel anyone to accept it apodictically. That's that's his phrase, or at least in English. All right. So he says, I can't prove it, um, and therefore I can't compel anybody to accept it, right? By deduction. Uh, but he quickly points out that in mathematics, unprovability is in no way equivalent to non-validity, since after all, not everything can be proved, and every proof presupposes unproved things. All right. All right. Then he notes that Piano's own formulary, I'm sorry, for, I'm, I'm sure I mispronounced that, uh, rests upon quite a number of unproved provable principles, claiming that Piano arrives at his own fundamental principles, by analyzing modes of inference that in the course of history of Kundi recognizes as valid, and by pointing out that the principles are intuitively evident and necessary for science. Right? And it's that latter one, necessary for science, where he's going to claim that the axiom of choice is going, to pay, is going to pay for itself. He then claims that these considerations can be urged equally well in favor of the disputed principle, namely the axiom of choice. He can't say intuitively evident, I don't think. If, you, if that's a psychological sense, because it's not intuitively evident, because a lot of really smart people <coughs> found it to be wrong, right? Um, he supports the claim that choice is necessary for science, but, you yeah, know, I've got some water here. All right. Um, but by providing a list of seven theorems that seem to rely on it, right? So what Zermelo did is, look, he says, look at all these places where the axiom of choice is used. And he gave a list of seven ones. Um, the mathematical community at the time, the logical community in particular, went well beyond that. Uh, all right, now here's a crucial quote. So long as the principle of choice cannot be definitively refuted, no one has the right to prevent the representatives of, per of productive science from continuing to use this hypothesis, as one may call it for all I care. Right? I love that phrase. Right? He says, as long as this hasn't been refuted, no one has the right to prevent anybody from using it as a hypothesis. And he says, as one may call for all I care, he says, call it a hypothesis if you want, right? Uh, and developing its consequences to the greatest extent, especially since any possible contradiction can be developed only in that way. Um, okay, now, so the perspective here, skipping, skipping the rest of the quote, is that any proposed axiom, right, anything you want to propose as a basic principle, uh, whether it's obvious, self-evident, innate, drive of, derived from, you know, uh, uh, from observing practice or even guess, uh, must pay its dues by playing a role in, an in a systemization of an established and successful practice. That it, you have to show that it plays an important role in a practice that has been proven successful for whatever purposes we have, explaining things, using it in science, and so on. Now, I'd urge something like this on behalf of McBride's too, the version of the successor principle the idea that every finite structure has an extension. Um, yeah, this could all skip. Uh, this is a connection with Chris Van Wright's notion of entitlement. Um, yeah, so this might be the, yeah, so, yep, so let me stop here. All right. So we'll stop here with that. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Are there questions? <coughs> Jessica? I just to warm up. Uh, a very, uh, no, very no, simple yeah. question. Uh, I didn't really get when you talk about what you really mean when you talk about uh, the ability to coherently discuss 
a structure is evidence for its existence. So um, usually the discussion about a structure should come in some form of language and theory. And uh, yeah, that's the way we describe anything. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but there are um, there are theories which we may not not know that they are coherent. Of course not. Uh, yeah. For instance, I was thinking about uh, points, new foundations, and those sort of things. But we, we haven't proven that they are inconsistent. Right. But we haven't yet proved that they are consistent. Correct. So, uh, are they supposed to play any role in here? Are they? Uh, how how can we account for the fact whether um, do, do you say that they, they actually describe some sort of structure if we cannot recognize their coherence? No, only if they're in fact coherent. Only so if only if I prove that there no, are no, theories. No, no, you didn't say if you prove. <laughs> Even if you cannot show that they, they are inconsistent. If, if you can't show that they're inconsistent, then of course you can't show. So you made you made an interesting um, interesting move, right? In this little exchange you just had now. So first you said, uh, if you can't, do I have to do I have to prove that the axiom is coherent first? And I said no. The axiom just has to be coherent. Right. Right. So um, so in effect, the upshot is this is just just the incompleteness theorem, really. Right. The upshot is that you can't ever know with with apodictic certainty with whether your whether your descriptions are coherent or not. Right. But if they're in fact coherent, then you're describing a structure. Does that help or mm, right? Right. right. Um, so new foundations may or may not. It's unknown whether that's coherent. So f the way I would translate that into the language of structuralism is that it's unknown whether in fact this is a describe the structure. Yeah, implicit definition of a structure. Right. And what about the fact that usually we prove or we show that the theory is consistent and that's, that's the best the best we can get? Well, we can't even do that if the theory, I mean, we haven't shown that zermelo frankel set theory is consistent. And that that would be the second question anyway. Yeah. Okay, but I usually prove co coherence as, as relative to... To something other, else. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Right, so you prove coherence... And, and so you switch, you switch, uh, you switch problem to, to some other theory. Yeah, and but it, it's, not a there there? it's not a foundationalist enterprise, right? So you say, look, uh, you know, so how do I know that arithmetic is coherent? And I say, well, seems to be. Says, no, I want, I want you to prove it. I say, okay, and then I prove it in set theory. Then you say, okay, then how do I know that set theory is coherent? Well, I can prove it in set theory plus an inaccessible. Well, no, you're actually getting worse here, right? Now you're taking it there, right? Uh, but you don't have to prove that this, the, uh, the, the, Right, so if you take the goal to be, and it back to the original question, if you take the goal to be, you only win if you've proven that you're, you, you're, uh, you're then, then you're not going to do that. Right. So um, it's a risky enterprise, right? But that's life, right? You know, Frege had that same, you know, I mean, he wasn't a structuralist, but, you know, he thought he was describing something called consistent. Turned out it wasn't. Yeah. Right. It's life, right? Uh, but, it's, but the burden is not for on you to show that, how did I put it? I said that. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, it would be hard to find this. It was near the beginning where I said an ability to remember which which page is it on? You got you have the you have the index on you. Yeah, it should be. Oh, God. Um, it's not so highlighted. Uh, then it should be. Yeah, I didn't highlight it on the slide. Um, yeah, it's uh, I found it on slide eleven. Oh. An ability to coherently discuss yes, a structure yes. is evidence that the structure exists. Yes. Now, of course, you don't know that you've coherently described anything, right? But you have evidence that it's coherent. You know, I mean, well, a lot of people have been looking for contradictions, and not too many in, in the case of new foundations, but uh, people have look, been looking for, for, uh, for contradictions in set theory for a long time. No one's found any. Now, if in fact you haven't, if it turns out that the Zermelo Frankel set theory is not consistent, then you're not describing anything. Right? But if it is coherent, then you are describing. That is evidence that you that you describe this structure. So all you are claiming really is the conditional. If it's coherent, then then it structures. Yeah, that's right. that's the coherence principle that's in the book. Right. And the way that that uh, feeds into epistemology is that if it seems like you're coherently describing something, then up to the it really being coherent, you actually are describing something. Does that help? Right. Yeah, it's not a foundationalist enterprise, and, and you sort of try to push me into one, I'll just resist the move, right? You can't prove it, right? 
the, you know, no one is, in, in a, you know, I mean, that's the incompleteness theorem, right? No one's gonna, gonna get around that problem. I mean, Hume's problem is hard enough, but this is, you know, this is a theorem. Right? Right, we're, not getting, we're not getting around that. Marina? That was the warm up? Yeah. Um, I didn't understand how affected your epistemological account that you did for the discover of the structures is different from a reductive epistemology. Because if you talk about pattern recognition and cognitive mechanism in all structures, it seems to me that you're, uh, that you're describing the oh, process in At, at that level, terms. probably right. At that level, you can think of it as reductive for pattern recognition. But when you're looking at, at, but pattern recognition is only going to deliver very small, finite structures. When you're looking to get more ri richer ones, you're going to end up inevitably using mathematical resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I didn't mean there's nothing reductive in it, but, well, no, I do mean there's nothing reductive. doesn't mean there aren't little pieces of it that, you could, that could be reductive. Even then, if, when you end up, you know, if you want to actually study pattern recognition, you know, more, <laughs> in more depth in psychology, you're going to end up using mathematical resources. Even, even in that, we will talk about the most significant and things like that. Yeah, it didn't mean that there's nothing non-mathematical in it. That's not what non-reductive means. But non-reductive -reduct would mean that it has to be entirely non-mathematical. Yes, Mr. Stewart. I am totally convinced with your reply. But I'm not convinced right. at all. That this must be about... This must be about the fourth time you've started an answer. <laughs> I've given a talk and you say, I'm totally convinced by it. And then you go on to, to, to some, give me some devastating remarks. So here it comes again. It's not concerning your paper. It's not concerning your philosophy, but not your paper. All right. The point is that I totally convinced with your reply to the paper. What I'm not convinced of, uh, of uh, is the question that is presented. What I mean, uh, your answer, if you understand well, is that uh, there are two sorts of uh, standard justification in mathematics, proofs and argumentation for actions. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know how to make proofs, and we know, more or less, it's not so, so codified, but more or less we know how to argo argue for actions. So what do you want more? Is the question, is, if you understand well, is this uh, your yeah. answer to... to, to that, that, that's good. That would make the paper a lot shorter. Okay. Right. But yeah, that, that, that sort of sums it up. So okay. So okay. That's true. What we cannot ask for. Right. The problem is that uh, it does not seem to me an uh, answer to the problem of the access. It okay. is at, at most a, a solution of the problem. You can say the problem of access is not my problem. But if you say that, you are no more at in some sense. It seems to me that the more problem that has appeared when you wanted to present your philosophy as a Platonist philosophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this case, you need to answer a, a question that uh, uh, Christian uh, Bob put, put uh, uh, in a book A that Christian Wright put to you in a paper, I don't remember when they say, how can you justify the fact that uh, coherently describing a structure, you make more that convey a structure of concepts? And really, you give an archetypical object. So the problem that says, in some sense, is the fact that the standard justifications that you are using to make a justification in mathematics are not simply justification of the fact that 3 plus 3 is a theorem. Yes. But they are justification of the fact that 3 plus 3 equals 6. And what do you, you, the point is there. How can you justify yeah. the fact that 3 plus 3 equals 6? Or better, how can you justify that the, the standard justification that you have in mathematics yeah. are not justification simply of the fact that the 3 plus 3 equals 6 is a theorem, but, but a justification of the fact that 3 plus 3 equals 6 is a theorem. It's so true. It's, it's true if you want to, it's true. And also true. The fact is that 3 plus 3 there is something that makes it true. So this is the problem of the access, if you understand. It's not simply the fact that we have to give a good justification because the answer, if the problem is we have to do justification, of course. All right, so then the, Remember that the answer is perfectly correct. Yeah, sure. So perhaps you can say, no, no, I don't want to go this way because I'm not Platonist at all, so it did not make sense to ask for that. Mathematics is simply no, 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 concept. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, right. so perfect, no problem, no problem with access. Right. But if you, are, you don't accept that, so you have to buy, you want to buy all the advantages of Platonist position, you have to stay me while your, your sort of your justification, our justification of the fact. The three plus three equals six, and this is your argument. 
doesn't know maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not following what, what question I'm supposed to answer. Uh, at one point, this may not be the same thing, but but at one point in the paper, um, which I didn't get into it, <coughs> uh, he notes that I'm sort of relying heavily on set theory. And he wants to know, well, what's uniquely structuralist about your, uh, why is your epistemology and epistemology of structures? Uh, given that I'm going to rely on set theory anyway, right, at some point, you know, in the, in the derivation. And I, I, I mean, I don't remember what I said in there, but I know I addressed that. that so I have to make it plausible, if not proved, that what it is we're, what it is we're doing when we're, when we're giving proofs of like 3 plus 3 equals 6, we're actually proving something about, it, about a structure. Exactly. Right. And um, that will come down about to... About what do you take to be the no, place no. of structure that is mathematical no, logic? Right. So how is it that the proof that, uh, that we're giving within mathematics, or the choice of axioms, if that's what it comes to, is actually axioms about a, an anti rent structure? Yeah. So yeah. I think that would, would, would the, I don't have a, I don't have a deductive argument for that. It would come down to how good of a, how good of an explanation structuralism is for whatever it is that, that are, you know, we're trying to do in philosophy and mathematics. So, so does my account uh, give a better explanation of mathematics as practiced and applied than the other ones? Yes, okay, but still, this simply answers the question, is structuralism like that? Yes. Like a good account of certain Practice not the mathematical theory, but perhaps not of all mathematics, but no, but a lot, a lot. No, no, but it's not a problem. Yeah, big yeah. part of it, right? Okay, the big part of it, no problem. This right. is, I, I agree. But the question is still that it is not an argument for saying that structuralism is, so to say, a Platonist position that you can use structural anti-structuralism and with by anti-structuralism by all the advantages. I see. Of, uh, of Platonism, right? Because it's not necessary to be Platonist. No, 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 no problem. But the problem is that Platonist, you cannot buy the, the advantages of Platonism. So, yeah, so, what, yeah, yeah, so what role is the you realism? Not buy both. Yeah. So what role is the realism doing in the explanation? Exactly. This is the point. Yeah. Well, it's a big question. I'd have to write. You know, you'd have to look at look at write the book or something again. But but I mean, it is a realist philosophy. If, if you could get the same advantages, or if you can get all the benefit, the explanatory benefits, with it with an irrealist account. Right, then, um, then it would be just as good. Right, right. So, uh, what work is the realism doing? Again, that, that's addressed in the book, but uh, but not in this paper. Yeah, yeah. I have a question, quite similar. Uh, so, you're saying that uh, the male strategy is a kind of justification. For McBride's two um, principles, too. We start uh, with McBride's two as a uh, guess, yeah. and then we see that yeah, it plays a, a central role in a successful enterprise, and Very so, yeah, yeah. and right. this <coughs> counts as a justification of this principle. Yeah. And, and the question is uh, why should we suppose that? Uh, we have to take a, a face value this mm -hmm. proposition. You said, you have just said that uh, um, if you are a realist, um, if you s accept uh, anterim structures, you have um, a sort of best explanation. And But in this case, you have to consider perhaps even um, mm -hmm extra mathematical beliefs in our mm -hmm. web of beliefs. And one could say, well, we have uh, many na broadly naturalistic beliefs, according to which roughly uh, all, uh, everything uh, is, um, everything, everything that exists is um, in space-time, let us suppose. And so, uh, this could lead us to, to uh, look for an alternative way to, to uh, explain what mathematical proposition seems to. And so, uh, another question. Yeah. What are your arguments for saying that uh, to be a realist is the 
the best explanation. Um, no, we'd have, yeah, so we'd have to do is sort of look at all the other philosophies and show that they're not as good. I mean, how <laughs> <laughs> do that? I mean, right. uh, so you, right? But the, uh, I mean, I take it that one of the um, advantages. All right, so it, that'd be a big, you know. When you're trying to weigh these on these holistic grounds, it's kind of hard to say, you know, in you know, in, in three minutes, why this one's better than this one. Uh, I, I I do like the account, the the fact that we end up with a face value interpretation of, of the mathematical theories. So most of the um, most of the other views, um, uh, like uh, require not the mathematical statements not to be taken at face value. So the uh, so what look like singular terms on my view really are singular terms, right? So the other counts have to have to do some other. Uh, they have to say no, it looks that way, but it isn't that way. It's really a quantified thing, or this and this and this. There's there's modals in there, or whatever it is. Uh, the epistemological problems, you know, of uh, of the modality, if that you know, if that's how how it's done. I mean, those are just as intractable here. I mean, so it's big literature on this. It's just sort of how you know how the trade off. The trade-offs go. I don't know if I can give a short answer, but the one that, that the realism that the realism does best on, I think, is that it gives a face value uh, reading of uh, of mathematical statements. That what looks like singular terms really are. Right. Now that's not you know uh, an overwhelming advantage. You know if the other theories could do well on other grounds, and you're right there. You know there is that intuition that everything exists exists in space time. Right. That has to be given up. Right. On a, on a view like this. Yeah, that's certainly right. And so we'd have to look to see what role that plays, right, in the overall, you know, overall um, web of belief. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm addressing your question or not. Uh, but in the, uh, it's hard to give a short answer, right, as to why this view is better. The, the main advantage I think it has over, over, the, over the irrealist versions of, of the irrealist structuralist versions, like Hellman's and, and so on, is that, it, is that we end up taking mathematical statements, we end up giving a much cleaner uh, and easier semantics. Now Jeffrey Hellman thinks that that's overrated. He says you're uh, you're hung up with uh, how did he put it surface grammar. Right. Again, I don't, you know I don't you know. And happily so. Hmm? And happily so. And happily so. Happily so. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because it supports. <laughs> you know. Right. Yeah. Um, answering Francesca before you said that uh, there is no um, structure corresponding to. Unconsistent theories, or well, so I was assuming. Assuming, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, so, what about? I mean, how is your ontology um, uh, related to, like, for example, paraconsistent theories, so theories that are admittedly inconsistent? So they are not talking about structure at all. So your ontology no, disqualifies no. this part of logic. Yeah, I guess it would have to. I mean, I, I really wasn't putting two and two together. I, I really should have because I just was. I just spent a week with Graham Priest, so oh. right. So I really should have been ready for this, right? but. But when I was writing the book, I was just assuming that everything's consistent. Uh, yeah, you have to. Uh, I don't know how the view would play itself out when you, uh, you know, when you sort of go with pair consistent or inconsistent. Um, uh, I'm, so far, I haven't really seen a whole lot of fruit that uh, inconsistent mathematics. Uh, the people working on this, Mortensen and and and, uh, and Ross Brady and and Graham Priest and so on, I haven't really seen a whole lot of fruit that's impressed me. But I wouldn't want to rule it out. Yeah, but what they're talking about when they say, so compare like a statement by a standard logician and a statement yeah. by a um, paraconsistent logician. Ev everybody's talking about structures. Right. Um, you can describe that in a very yeah, formal. Sometimes Grant Priest likes to talk about impossible structures and he you know, says, well, those, they don't exist, but they are, right? You know, it's sort of Minonian. Yeah, so if, I, if we wanted to sort of bring that in, we'd have to complicate the story. Yeah. But uh, Stuart, uh, why do you need uh, to, to, to present it as a necessary specific condition? Why you don't, you are not you content to simply present it as a specific condition? Oh, that if it is a, a current interscribe structure. If it's not oh. current, who knows? Why not? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's not the first time he's answered a question. <laughs> I should bring him around whenever I get one on. <laughs> so he usually answers some of the questions, but he usually asks some that are pretty hard too. So I need to bring him around, but only bring him up sometimes. No, you're, uh, so I should I could present it as a sufficient condition. All what is enough for for you? No, actually. So what I've been thinking about lately, you know, since this, there are non-classical mathematical theories. 
And that would be an example of that and what to make of those. Right? So can I bring the non-classical theories or, or especially the paraconsistent ones are going to be the hardest into the overall framework of, of structuralism? And that, yeah, that's an interesting, uh, interesting problem that I haven't really worked out yet. I think in, in, in the book, it is presented as a sufficient condition. Yeah, um, that's I mean, right. It describes the structure if it's coherent and categorical. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, it's so uh, but I didn't say if it's not coherent or it's not categorical, then then there's no structure there. That's you, right. You did. You didn't. No, I didn't say that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Sometimes I happen to word things in a way that works out later. Yeah. Based on some rather questions that I never thought of before. But uh, 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 about that is really a uh, very, very practical question that uh, I can never really understand. You need that in the book to make a distinction between uh, coherence and consistency. Yes. Uh, of course, anything that is not consistent is not coherent. Well, that's part of what was being raised here. No, no, I want to talk. Do you think right. that anything, something is consistent if only if it is coherent? Or no, I certainly wouldn't say that. I, uh, because otherwise there is no distinction. Yeah. So you think that coherence is a stronger one or a weaker one? What the relation? The logical well, relation. I, have, I wasn't thinking about paraconsistent mathematics or inconsistent mathematics when I thought of that. Yeah. Like, okay. And um, what I was thinking of is really second order stuff, higher order mathematics. Mm -hmm. So an example of a structure that, or of a theory, not a structure, a theory that would be incoherent, although consistent, would be uh, say start with second order, you know, arithmetic. And then take uh, you know the, the further statement that the theory that the the, set, the, the theory is inconsistent or you know where in other, in other words where the theory is categorical uh, and yet you add to it another axiom that um, would make it where there's no models for it but yet it's still consistent the negation of a girdle sentence or something like that that's really what I had in mind. So I'd like to say satisfiable would be better, but you can have something consistent, but not uh, correct. Yes, and what I had in mind by there would be something like second order piano arithmetic plus the negation of the variable girl sense. Okay. <coughs> but how to bring that when you know when when it, when paraconsistent mathematics is sort of brought under the table, assuming that that you know that, that that's legitimate, then things are going to be. I'm not quite sure what to do. If anybody's looking for a research project. Can I jump in with a question? Um, if that's the question. So yeah, that, that was it. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> and uh, um, there's a uh, uh, one unwelcome consequence that usually non-holist thinkers um, stress against holists is that no belief of ours has a special role to play in our web of belief. That every belief is in principle revi uh, revisable. Yeah. Uh, now, that, that is, is particularly striking when we consider the, play, the role of logic and mathematics within our complete web of beliefs. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking whether something similar, whether you would accept some the, 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 the parallel, the, 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 the mirroring um, uh, unwelcome consequence just with respect to mathematics. Uh, if your epistemology is in a holist one, uh, it seems to me that um, there might be very different reasons why, for example, uh, a, a belief uh, moves from being just an hypothesis to be, sorry, uh, from being just an hypothesis. Oh. Yeah, that, that wasn't, the, yeah, whatever. That's the name of my cat. Um, <laughs> from an hypothesis to being an axiom. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be two, two issues. One that uh, there seems to be not prima facie, at least about especially ordinary practice, uh, maybe as opposed to scientific practice, there seems to be nothing, nothing special uh, that differentiates between like the successor uh, principle and two plus two equals four. For, for everyday life, uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4 has a much more central role than the successor, sure. actually, in, in, in some sense. Right. And another <coughs> question is, an, another issue is that um, uh, so the, 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 there's you nothing, sorry. I'm kind of wondering what, you said another issue, I wasn't clear what the first issue was. Oh, uh, the, the first issue was why in that holist perspective, sorry, that, that caused both. 
uh, why in your oldest perspect perspective uh, these particular axioms that define those particular structures, natural numbers, real numbers, whatever, has a special role to play. It doesn't. Oh, right, good. That is, the, the, the notion of an axiom, right, is, is not going to be understood as a self-evident truth. It's just, you know, you need to characterize the structure somehow, in the, what you're talking about, and whatever you choose to characterize it. Right, but, but the problem with the Hollis is that, no uh, take axiom. the principle of contradiction. Okay, um, if we, I mean, in the, in the radical original yeah. Aquinian uh, view, in if uh, experience go wrong, yeah. we can uh, keep our um, yeah, no, I know yeah, strange hypothesis yeah. and delete the principle of contradiction. Would you accept of doing the same with the existence of structures or the existence of, of the natural number structures? Of course. Right. Yeah, nothing, nothing's, uh, nothing is sacred in this. But yeah. th but that seems to conflict with uh, a realist Why? view, because oh, oh. yeah, because it seems that you're claiming uh, at the same time that Even the real number structure is a platon is a platonic object yeah. which exists, right. but at the same time that your epistemology is such that given contrary evidence somehow not even the existence of the uh, natural number structure is unrevisable. Not even the nothing's unrevisable. Right. You know, on the, even the realism is. Revisable. Okay. I'm not sure if the uh, if the revisability is revisable. <laughs> right. You know, they're 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 sort of we can push this thing far enough, but even the realism is just going to be a, an inference to the best explanation. Mm -hmm. right. Maybe I'm missing what what. Okay. No, no. 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 It's okay. It's right. okay. Maybe I'm probably, probably am missing what's going on. Yeah. There's nothing special about. I thought you were asking about axiom choice. Nothing special. Axioms aren't playing this sort of any special foundationalist role here or any special role at all. Mm -hmm. You need to axiomatize the structure somehow and whatever you pick in describing it uh, or those are the axioms. You could have picked other ones. Right. It seems also to me to claim that those uh, the structures does describe do exist. Yeah. And if they exist, they exist necessarily. Yeah. And have to gather an epistemology that tells you that uh, they might not exist or that you can do without them if evidence uh, I, I, if evidence came along uh, evidence in a broad sense yeah sure sure right, sure came along i would revise the real <coughs> okay right. okay okay right. but anyways but that was the one i stopped you before you wanted to go on to the second one no 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 no, no. that was covering the, 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 that the, was the yeah yeah okay, right. okay. Right. are there any other questions just for clarification uh, would you be ready to say that uh, in your epistemic uh, picture, we start as thinking uh, of uh, all piano actions as mere hypothesis that while we're working on with that? Well, with they've those certainly gone well beyond that. I mean, so there's a difference between, I said there, uh, and this view is on any other, there's a difference between a working hypothesis and, uh, you know, yeah, the boundaries are so thin are fuzzy that and they can and something can start life one way and be, you know and end up being a pretty solid central piece in the, the picture later. Yeah, so so it's yeah, so I wouldn't claim that these are work, these are working hypotheses now, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean they're pretty central. Right, they are. But but the idea was uh, whether you would be completely happy with uh, claiming that, for instance, just as the induction, full induction action of Second order kind of arithmetic possibly started as as a working hypothesis yeah. way back then. Um, this yeah. Also, also the, the very simple actions like zero is a number yeah. started as mm -hmm. so yeah. kind of hypothesis that established through time uh, through successful practices. Yeah, or probably not the only way, but the, I suppose it could have happened. You know, where sort of I don't know. I don't know, you know, you'd never get this thing started if you did that. So we can, again, I don't know if we can do a uh, sort of Cartesian reconstruction of everything. Forget you know anything, then come up with some working hypotheses and see how well they do, right? Um, you, know, <coughs> you have to sort of think of it as more and more as as other chancellors <coughs> now and Quine did too. You sort of have to think of the the enterprise we've already inherited, and we're working with that. And you don't have to sort of redo the whole thing from the beginning, you know, the way uh, you know, say Descartes wanted to. Sure. Yeah. So. We, yeah, I, don't, I can't see how you can go from no knowledge at all to the knowledge we have now, <coughs> starting with everything being a working hypothesis. Right? 
I don't know if that's what you're asking. Yeah, but, yeah that's right. right. Yeah, I don't know if that would even make sense. You sort of have to sort of take the enterprise that we have now and then tinker with it and you know and correct it at, you know as we go, right? Using this, you know, this this methodology. Can you, if there's no one from behind, Don't just be shy, the, the, yeah. Sorry, yeah, they're, they're shy. <laughs> yeah, they're shy. I wanted to be. <laughs> Um, you present your framework as a um, within sorry your view as being within a framework of uh, naturalized epistemology. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm not which an epistemologist, sorry. I'm not an epistemologist. Right. So right. But the, I'm yeah. But that there was that the the uh, that's just. To, 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 to clarify, because of course there is something very important in applications uh, of, of uh, mathematics and does an application of structures and that could be a, a path through which we get knowledge of uh, structure. Uh, but there's, there seems to be, um, um, I mean, a particular point in naturalized epistemology, which is the rejection of uh, a priori knowledge. And uh, is this compatible with your view? Because it seems to me that there is a, a one of the uh, ways you describe in which we can have knowledge of uh, structures is through <laughs> implicit definition. And in a fairly common understanding of implicit definition, the knowledge that is delivered by implicit definition is a priori knowledge. Is it in your account? And I don't give much thought to the a priori, at least not here, in, in analytic you know, notions like that. And I just haven't given much thought to those. I'm not sure if those notions um, are sharp and as clear as they ought to be. Right. Or can be or whatever. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not a big fan of operating right knowledge. Right. Um, but I don't know if I'm an opponent of it either. I'm not claiming it's all empirical, you know, like, like wine does. Okay, so it's naturalized epistemology in, in a weaker not, sense than... Oh, than much weaker, yeah. In the sense that I don't want to answer any hard questions. Right. That's what I'm trying to do. Right, <laughs> right. right. It's not based everything on empirical knowledge no, or, 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 like or, or cognitive processes yeah, like right, yeah. description, implicit, I mean, axiomatic characterization is a good way of getting knowledge of a structure. I think this is a well that your phenomenology seems to in the sense that you do consider that the knowledge that we are the knowledge that we are considering is about the knowledge that no mathematician can have in normal time. That's the idea the there. What we are speaking about. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, trying not to something to like an abstract knowledge that someone of a subject can have, but simply the knowledge of mathematicians. That they have when, and when they're doing it well in favorable cases, they're getting it right. And I'm not trying to reconstruct it on first principles. And it is said that it's not the opposite of your a priori, because it's possible that this knowledge is a priori knowledge. It's a priori, right. I don't know what to make of that distinction. I'm not a big fan of it. And if you sort of push it hard, you know, I'm not. No, I'm sure where you know where it's going, okay. what it's for. Right. Right. Okay. Are there questions from the shy <laughs> people? <laughs> if there are no other questions, okay. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, Stuart is going to be in uh, Bologna tomorrow. For those who don't know it, there's a workshop with uh, Stuart Spear and uh, Achille Valzi tomorrow afternoon. So uh, you're all invited, of course. Where? Where? Uh, it's in uh, Dipartimento di Disciplina della Comunicazione, Viazzo Gardino 23 in Bologna, very close to the station. <laughs> Go to the station and follow the crowd. Yeah, follow the crowd. <laughs> <laughs>